Hi, my name is Bridget and I'm here today from Your Baby's Biome. It's an information resource for both parents-to-be, parents and health professionals, all about the infant microbiome. So in the next half hour, we're going to discover how the microbes that your baby gets at birth can help set them up for a life of health and well-being. And if you work in birth, how important it is that at every step we have the microbiome in mind, which helps get every baby that great bacterial start. So you may not think you know what the microbiome is, but I bet you've heard about gut health and how important gut health is. And the reason that gut health is important is because of the microbes, the microbiome that we all have in and on us. If you didn't know, you're actually slightly less human than you think you are. For every one human cell you have, you have between one and three bacterial cells. We are walking ecosystems. Each one of us has in us and on us a hundred trillion microorganisms. And you may well have seen the adverts for food on magazines talking about how important gut health is. And to be fair, they're right. They're right. The happier the microbes in your gut are, the happier the human attached to those microbes are. So I'd like you to meet your microbes. Now we are, each one of us has in us and on us a hundred trillion microorganisms. Now I know that sounds a little gross, but actually it's amazing because we've evolved alongside bacteria. We've evolved with it and actually it's become part of how we function as humans. In your gut, which is where we're going to be thinking about particularly at the moment, there are trillions of bacteria. And those trillions of bacteria should be made up of about a thousand species. And these bacteria not just live there, but they actively contribute in some part to the health of the human attached to the gut. So, for example, they do things like produce vitamins that we can't make or synthesize ourselves, like water soluble vitamin Bs and vitamin K. They are part of our blood vessel growth. They break down the final food, the fibrous food that gets through the intestines, convert it to short chain fatty acids, which feeds the cells in our, in our bodies. They also have all sorts of immune roles within our body. And this is crucial when we're talking about babies and early life. So actually, you can see on this picture that there are all sorts of roles that are performed by our gut bacteria. And it's like a big rainforest in there. All these species, some helping us, some, you know, possibly potentially to do us damage, but part of the big ecosystem that is our microbiome or our microbiota. Now, we know a lot about our microbiome and we also know increasingly that you need to have that diversity in the gut that actually strength is in diversity when it comes to microbiomes. And when people don't have that, when, for example, their gut is in dysbiosis or imbalance, where there's one species that's starting to dominate, that has been linked to a number of human illnesses, such as obesity, diabetes, all of the colonic cancers. There are some indicators that it's the start of things like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. And as you can see from this list, anything sort of irritable bowel, anything colonic, they tend to have some sort of influence by our gut bacteria. So keeping our gut bacteria healthy is really, really important. It is true. The healthier your gut bacteria is, the healthier the human attached to that gut tends to be. So what has this got to do with babies? Well, it's about how you get your microbiome. The microbiome is, you can think of it as a maternal heritage. Humans have been amazing. We've survived and thrived across the globe. And if you were a baby being born in the Sahara, you would come across all sorts of bacteria, viruses, and fungi in your daily life. If you were being born in the Arctic Circle, they would be different if you are born in Britain, if you are born in New Zealand. What you are going to come across will be different based on your habitat and the kind of food that you come across. Now, we know that each human's microbiome is completely unique. It is much more unique than our DNA. Um, but you do see patterns for people. So, for example, in Japan, the whole population may have more of a bacteria that's good at digesting seaweed. And you can see how, from an evolutionary point of view, that's been really helpful. Um, so what happens, or what has happened historically, is that each mother has passed on to her baby, as they are born, this starter kit of microbes. 
a set of bacteria to establish their gut bacteria and get them ready in a world where every second of every day you are exposed to trillions of bacteria by helping their body learn which are good bacteria and which might be harmful, which are friend and which are foe. Now, until very recently in human history, every human baby who survived to adulthood had passed down a birth canal. So this is significant. We used to, we're not sure, we used to think we're not sure entirely if babies are completely sterile in the womb. At one point, some researchers thought they'd found evidence of the microbiome in the placenta. Actually, what we found so far are DNA traces of bacterial communities, but that's not the same as finding communities. So at the moment, the belief is still that babies are pretty much sterile in the womb. And the majority of what we call the seeding, the establishment of the microbiome, takes place as a baby is born, as they pass down the birth canal and pick up a myriad, like a starter kit or a payload of bacteria. And this vertical transmission, as we call it, from mother to baby, has been throughout history how babies have got their starter kit of bacteria. They then do skin to skin with their mother when they're born, which is great because it establishes the skin communities. And the final piece of the puzzle was breast milk, because breast milk is packed full of microbes for babies. It's an ongoing supply of microbes for an infant. And interestingly, there's always been an element of breast milk that's completely non-digestible to babies. Now, it's, there are um, human milk oligosaccharides. They're a form of carbohydrate. And to be fair, there was a bit of uncertainty as to why, why part of breast milk was not useful for the baby. And now we know what it's for. It's to feed the right microbes. It's so important that the baby gets the right microbes that breast milk actually provides foods that help some very specific 200 different types of, that we've identified so far of human milk oligosaccharides to feed individual strains of bacteria, which is just incredible. So actually, the starter kit that babies get is important. And what happens in early life to help establish that that starter kit to get their microbiome going has really long implications for human health. So now we need to find out everything we can do to give every baby the best start. Now what's really important to say here is you might be thinking, well what about the babies who are born by caesarean? They don't pass down the birth canal, they don't pick up this starter load. Well that's completely why I established your baby's biome. I have four children. My eldest, my gorgeous Alexander, was born by emergency caesarean, so he didn't pass down a birth canal. And I then went on to have three straightforward births, or a VBAC as they're known, vaginal birth after caesarean. Now, 20 years of science now is starting to show us that when babies don't have their microbiome established in the uh, vertical transmission fashion, when there are alterations to their microbiome at birth, that can sometimes, and it's sometimes, this is not all the time, trigger responses in the body because the immune system almost gets um, false training, that it learns to attack things that aren't really a problem. Now, remember, one story does not science make, <laughs> but bear with me. Um, my one, my eldest, is the only one of my four who has life-threatening allergies, I mean really, really severe allergies, and severe asthma, both of which are associated with an altered microbiome. Now, just to be very clear here, I, I don't feel bad that he had a caesarean. He needed to be born by a caesarean. We wouldn't have my gorgeous boy if he wasn't born by a caesarean. What I would like is if I'd known what I'd known all those years ago, what I know now about the microbiome, I could have just done more to protect his. So this is not about anybody's choice about how they give birth. It's about knowledge. It's about knowing that it makes a difference and then going, OK, what can we do to help every baby have the best bacterial start? So however your baby needs to be born, it's OK. It's OK. We're going to give each baby the best start. And that's really, really important. Now, just very important to point out that it's not all entirely formed at birth. Lots of things about early life influence how a microbiome is established. A really important part of that is the health of the microbiome that mum is passing down. So what we're going to look at in a minute is how women who are pregnant can get their microbiome into a really healthy condition because that's the payload that they're passing on to baby. That's the starter kit that baby will get. 
So and you can see from here though, it's mum's health of mum's microbiome makes a difference. Stress in pregnancy does have an impact on mum's microbes and so therefore on the microbes past a baby. And again, we'll look at this in a moment. The gestational age of a baby when they are born has an impact as well. Obviously, the mode of birth, whether a baby is born vaginally or a baby is born by cesarean birth, is going to have an impact. Skin to skin immediately afterwards, but also how they are fed. Breast milk is an absolutely live supply of microbes and it's got food for microbes. And formula is, is fine. Formula it gives nutritionally everything baby needs, but it's not the same. It doesn't contain all these human milk oligosaccharides. Now, there are moves by formula companies to add some of these uh, probiotic and feeding um, elements to formula. But at the moment, they're adding three or four, which the research suggests doesn't work as well synthetically as the real one does. Whereas breast milk has 200 of them. Um, as well as other benefits for baby. So how you're fed is going to have an impact on the establishment of the microbiome. Um, obviously things like whether mum is very malnourished before a baby is born will have an impact or whether mum is very obese may have an impact as well. Any antibiotics in pregnancy and around birth um, and then of course when baby starts to take on food so when you wean what you feed them on and the environment that they're born into are all going to have an impact and we're going to have a look at those as we go through. So let's talk about pregnancy. In pregnancy there are a number of changes to mum's gut microbiome and to her vaginal microbiome and what we really want to do is try and make sure that it's as healthy as possible to pass on to the baby. If I wasn't speaking about the microbiome and I was just talking about pregnancy, I would be encouraging all pregnant women to try to reduce their stress. Stress is not good for anybody and it's particularly not good for pregnant women. So if, if, if we weren't talking about the microbiome, I'd still be talking about this from a neurology point of view. But actually what's really fascinating is that when we are highly stressed, stress is damaging to our gut microbes. They get stressed too. And they don't like it and, and they are impacted by high levels of stress. Now some stress in daily life is normal and it's fine and we are talking about high levels of stress. But actually anything that you can do to look after yourself is good. Possibly staying away from some people who stress you out a little bit. If we can avoid them that would be good. Taking time to do self-care, to look after yourself, to do nice things every day. Sometimes, you know, self-care is not enough to solve stress. Sometimes you might need an intervention. You might need some help. You might need to go and see your GP or speak to your midwife about getting a little bit of additional support. And that's absolutely okay. In fact, it is good that you reach out if you need that bit more help. Um, but whatever we can do to help reduce our stressful environment, just try to have some fun. Do something lovely for yourself every single day. The other one, now this is, <laughs> this is quite tricky under COVID, is ordinarily I would be talking to you about antibacterial cleaners. Because if you look at the front of your antibacterial cleaner, it tells you that it cleans 99.9, .9, kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. And right up until this talk started, that probably seemed like a very good thing. But if we are so dependent on our microbes, is that a good thing? Because does antibacterial kill everything or just the bad things? Now, under COVID, we have a different set of priorities here. Staying healthy, staying COVID free is absolutely the priority when you are pregnant. We don't want anybody to get COVID-19, but we particularly do not want pregnant women to get it. If nothing else, for the fact that it will so limit your birth choices and... Um, because obviously worries about it having an impact on mum or baby. But so we have a balance to be struck here. Anything that is maybe still coming in the house, you might want to clean really well. But actually within your home, you might just be maybe moving to some plant-based stuff. Now this, you know your risk level, but just be mindful that if you are spraying it and pouring it, it is altering your immediate microbiome as well. Really, what you want to focus on is making your microbiome as healthy as possible. And that old saying that you are what you eat should really be you are what your microbes eat. 
it's feeding them well that is going to be the key to a healthy microbiome. Now, I get asked a lot about whether, you know, taking a Yakult or anything like that is going to make a difference. And to be honest, it depends where you're starting from. If your diet is incredibly unhealthy, you know, just fast food all the day, then it's, it's good. But nothing, nothing beats food. A wide variety of non-processed food. Now, if you go on to babiesbiome.org, so world, www, babiesbiome, all in one word, dot org, on the page all about the pregnant gut, we have a whole page of stuff, stuff that you can eat, things that you can look for, and more and more stuff coming on there all the time. But as a spoiler, what you really want to eat is a wide variety of non-processed food. Now, if you look at that lovely salad there, there's at least 16 different foods in there, and that's what your microbes want. Um, I have this with my teens quite a lot. They think if they've eaten some lettuce, they've had a salad and they've had their five a day. And I'm like, no, no, you don't want five. We're not even aiming for seven. You're aiming for as many as you can in a day. So, you know, if you're making something, chop in a few extra veg, whatever you find in the fridge. You know, don't, don't stress yourself about whether or not it's what it says in the recipe. Just think variety, herbs, spices, all these things provide something that feeds our microbe. So wide variety of non-processed food. Remember, the more highly processed a food is, the worse it is for your microbiome. Um, there are foods, as you will see on the website, that will help provide uh, microbes and there will foods that will feed microbes. And we want more and more of the food that will feed them and some of the ones that will add microbes. Um, and there's a little bit more about that, the types of food that you might want to eat. Particularly, you know, if you can eat a little bit of organic meat rather than just factory farms, it tends to be better. Although we don't have the problems here in the UK that you might see in the USA where there's a lot of antibiotics used in food. Um, things like bio yogurts will help, they will help add good bacteria. So there's all sorts of ways that we can help build our microbiome up. Try, try, try to avoid too much sugar. Artificial sweeteners, again, are known to be not good for um, microbes. Things like um, mayonnaise, emulsifiers, anything that, if you look on, the, if you look in the ingredients, anything that is used to prolong shelf life, so your emulsifiers and binders, they not just um, bind up the food, but they also bind up your gut bacteria. So I'm afraid they're not very good. Now, what I don't want to do is stress pregnant women out about what they're eating, but just try to be sensible. Even if you just try to include more variety, that's a really good thing. Um, and again, you know, as much non highly processed food as you can manage would be just super. So another thing that we do need to think about then is antibiotics. Antibiotics are the most commonly prescribed medication in pregnancy. And the thing with antibiotics is that they work on all of your um, bacteria, all of your microbes. They're not selective. They don't just take out the bad guys. Now, absolutely, the invention of antibiotics has saved lives, transformed surgery, and has helped us become so much healthier as humans because we have been able to beat some diseases. But I don't think anybody disagrees now that overuse of, an of antibiotics is not helping us. It is not helping our immune system. So in pregnancy, if you need them, you must have them. If you need them, you, you do need them. But again, it's just avoiding unnecessary ones because any that we don't need um, do have alterations on the microbiome. And again, it's what we pass on to our babies. Other positive ways that you can help your microbiome is to exercise. <laughs> Actually, your microbes like it a lot when you work out. Now, the guideline is that pregnant women should do about 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. So that's five lots of 30 minutes. Do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever sparks joy, I think is the phrase that we all go for, isn't it? Um, but doing something. So not only will you feel better, it's good for mental health, it's good for you physically, but actually it makes your microbes happy too. Just find something you like, I always think. Don't do anything that makes you miserable. Um, and lastly, getting outdoors. Now, I don't think very many of us have access to the beautiful spaces that I have put on these slides, but, you know, one likes to aim high. Um, but get out. There is 
you know, there is a reason sometimes why people who go out and take regular walks outside or garden or do something feel better. And partly, yes, it is the, the sunshine, uh, you know, the feel of, of wind on their skin, but also it's microbes. The microbes benefit from being outdoors and getting new ones and breathing them in and coming into contact with natural microbes. So go for a walk if there's a local park, if there's um, a wood or a hill nearby that's not too strenuous and you can climb, go and do it. Get yourself outdoors and your microbes will benefit as well as yourself. So there's all sorts of things that we can do to help make the microbiome as healthy as possible in pregnancy. And all of them, to be fair, are just quite nice anyway and will help overall health. Um, but it does mean that this payload, this starter kit that we pass on, is a little bit healthy. We're going to talk about birth. So this is the moment where the baby gets their starter kit established. And first of all, we're going to think about a vaginal birth. So this is the moment where the baby passes down the birth canal and is coated in this bacteria. Now we know, and there's a bit more information on this on the website, about how the, the changes that take place in the, the vaginal microbiome in the run-up to birth to get ready to pass on this payload. And when babies are born, quite often there's a little bit of fecal matter that they will brush across or come into contact with as they're born. Now it's not an accident that sometimes women will have a little bit of a bowel movement during labour. It's to ensure that babies pick up some gut bacteria as well. It's not an accident. And so as baby is born, they get this starter kit. And you can see here that these are the things that are forming the baby's microbiome it, at birth. The vaginal microbes, the gut microbiome, skin to skin contact as they are born, but also what's in the environment, which is why we'll see shortly that you see differences depending on whether a baby is born at ho in hospital or at home. Um, also the first milk that they get. And all these things are contributing towards that initial start of baby's microbiome. Now this is really important because the microbes that get in first are the ones that train the immune system, that say we're good. Now there was a study that came out in 2018 that showed that whichever microbes colonize first, that they are likely to be the most significant. They remain the most dominant. Um, so actually what the, the, getting the right bacteria in the right at the right time and in the right order is significant for human health. So what we can see in this next slide here is if you look across the top at the different microbial makeups of the three mothers, and you see each one of them has their own unique microbiome. But what you can see is that at birth, the microbiome of the vaginally born baby looks so much more like the, the microbiome of the mother than, for example, the caesarean born baby. Now, over time, those differences become less. But again, it's, we think it's what happens in the initial training of the immune system that makes this so significant. That is what makes a big difference. And as we said before, one of the things that makes a difference is where you are. So if you have a look at this, this graphic, and you, know, and, and you may not be able to see the detail, but it's okay. What you can see really clearly is that there is a difference in the starter microbes that babies get when they are born at home and when they are born at hos in hospital. And in fact, um, you know, a couple of studies have suggested that kind of the gold standard for microbial seeding is a home vaginal birth with immediate skin to skin and breastfeeding. Because there the baby gets mum's bacteria, home bacteria, and then extra bacteria and food for that bacteria from breastfeeding. Now, if you want to have your baby in hospital, that's fine. If you need to have your baby in hospital, that is also fine. Um, but this is just saying, you know, that actually there is a microbial benefit for those of you who want to look into or explore a home birth as well. Say it again, we need the right bacteria at the right time and in the right order. Now, if mum has a vaginal birth, and particularly if she gets to do skin to skin and breastfeeding, really, you don't need to think very much about the microbiome at birth. You don't. That's the system that is our natural way of 
what uh, one of the scientists calls it inoculating a baby, inoculating them in the sense that they give them the immune system training that they need in early life. You don't need to do very much. Where we might need to be thinking more about the microbiome is if it isn't a vaginal birth, but if babies are born by caesarean. So what happens if babies do need to be born by caesarean? Well, caesarean births are a little different and there are differences within caesarean birth. So it does depend whether or not it's a planned caesarean or an elective caesarean where mum doesn't labour at all or a caesarean where mum has gone into labour and then maybe it needs to become a caesarean birth. Um, but it's interesting that we do see differences in the microbes that babies pick up in their initial seeding of the microbiome. And there have been numerous studies now that have shown a significant difference in the starter kit of bacteria that babies get, whether they are born vaginally or whether they are born by caesarean birth. Now, a, a recent study did say, look, by the time you're a couple of weeks in, they are much more similar. But remember, it's the ones that get in first that will remain the most dominant. And it's the ones that get in first that train the immune system. And this is why potentially babies who are born by caesarean are at increased chance, risk of asthma, allergies and a number of health conditions. Now, remember, it's an increase in risk. I don't like the word risk. Fabulous Dr. Sarah Wickham, have a look at her stuff, she's well worth looking at. She talks about calling it chance, they're at a higher chance of something happening. Not all babies who are born by cesarean will go on to have asthma or allergies or anything. A load of them are absolutely fine. But for me, it's a numbers game. You know, they are, babies born by cesarean are 20% more likely, for example, to have asthma. Now, if there are 800,000 births in the UK in a year, and of that 800,000 births, 25% of those are born by caesarean. And that 25% of 800,000 is at increased risk of asthma. That's a lot of babies who potentially could have their life impacted by um, conditions that just make life harder on a daily basis. And I know this because of my boy. Every day he has to read every label. He's very mindful about playing sports or going out when the pollen's high or everything, anything that could endanger him. And I want to make sure that every baby, however they're born, does not have to live that way. Now, this is interesting. This is from The Lancet. So last year, very, very well respected in a medical journal, The Lancet, ran a, ran a whole edition, or a whole issue rather, on caesarean birth. And listen to this, there is emerging evidence that babies born by caesarean birth have different hormonal, physical, bacterial and medical exposures, and that these exposures can subtly alter neonatal physiology. Short term risks include altered immune development, increased likelihood of allergy, HP and asthma and reduced intestinal gut microbiome diversity. Now, remember, there's strength in diversity. So this is our this is our, the issue and potentially why babies who are born by caesarean may have more conditions. And if you have a look on this slide, you can see some of the conditions that the Lancet has linked through research to being born by caesarean. It's a bit scary, isn't it? Okay, don't panic. Do not panic. This is really, really important. I say it again. It's not a certainty. It's an increased risk. And actually what we really want to do is bring that chance, bring that risk down and give every baby, regardless of how they are born, the best bacterial start. OK, just to remember, before we talk about everything we can do to make caesarean births as microbiome friendly as we can, that there is a difference between elective or planned caesareans, one where mum doesn't go into labour and ones where mum has laboured. So in an elective caesarean, mum doesn't labour. And there are, there are two things with that. One, baby doesn't pass down the birth canal at all, so doesn't get the seeding. And also there are a lot of questions around epigenetic alterations. Um, and again, there's a little bit more about that that um, we, we see on, our, on the website if you want to know a little bit more. But elective uh, caesarean babies do not pass down a birth canal, so they don't have any seeding of the microbiome. Um, whereas babies who, for example, uh, mum has laboured, waters have gone, uh, baby will have had some exposure. 
they will have had some experience of labour and the stresses of labour help kind of kickstart babies and trigger systems to get them going and ready for life on the outside. So they will have had some of the benefits. Now both sets of babies will have had some, usually have some antibiotics because after a cesarean mum clearly needs antibiotics. And again there was a study quite recently where doctors delayed giving the antibiotics to mum until after the baby was born. Now this was really interesting because this helped show whether it was the mode of birth or the antibiotics that were leading to the caesarean alterations in microbiome and you still saw the alterations but actually it benefited the health of the babies not to be exposed to the antibiotics in utero. Again if you need antibiotics or baby needs them that's fine but actually just by delaying them that they were given to mum after the baby was delivered did seem to be beneficial in terms of microbial starts for babies but if they still didn't pick up that starter kit yeah does that make sense um, now what we really want to know is how we can help babies get the best bacterial start and for this what you're looking at is um, things that we can do that can help really give babies some microbial seeding when they haven't passed down a birth canal. So some microbiome friendly ideas. One, if possible, if mum could go into labour, ideally labour would start, um, there would be some seeding of the microbiome and then you would go to caesarean birth. Now there are many reasons why this would not be possible. Yeah, there are many reasons why this might not be possible but it is something to consider as we move forward in terms of how we can give every baby the best bacterial start. Absolutely one of the key, 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 key for helping restore the microbiome is breast milk. Now I say this with absolute kindness that really this is not about trying to make anybody feel guilty about their feeding choices. It's just that if you give one breastfeed it can still help establish the baby's microbiome. This is not about personal choice, it's just about what the science tells us and the science tells us that breast milk can really help a microbiome after a baby has been born uh, by caesarean. Now some women are considering harvesting colostrum first because that wouldn't have been impacted by um, any antibiotics but in no, under no circumstances is that to substitute for a first breastfeed. It could be an as well because it will be unadulterated um, by any antibiotics but even with antibiotics the breast milk still comes full of fabulous microbes. Um, so if you can do. Now a lot of women if they can't breastfeed may consider donor milk as well and if babies are born, born very prematurely lots of units have access to um, a milk bank and pasteurized milk and even though the milk has been pasteurized and frozen and doesn't have the live microbial element that is still beneficial to babies. Other things that you can consider are blankets from home to wrap baby in a lovely blanket from home which will bring of course home bacteria remembering that the best um, the gold standard for uh, microbial seeding was a home vaginal birth because the microbes that babies pick up around them are from home and not from hospital um, so bringing in a blanket from home now you couldn't take it into theater because it's not sterile but as soon as you get to recovery you can wrap the baby in it and lastly skin to skin lots and lots of skin to skin baby. These are small steps that we can do just to help babies um, get the best bacterial start and this is why it, you know it's so important I will say it again it's you know caesareans are a really good really safe option for birth and if your baby needs to be born by caesarean they need to be born by caesarean. I am very very grateful that my son could be born by caesarean that, that it was there to help him when he needed that. So this is no way about knocking cesarean, it's just about give, making sure that every baby, however they're born, gets the best bacterial start. Okay, I'm not gonna say too much about this now because it's a really big topic and honestly, it's, it's got some wonderful science and I could go on for quite a long time. Um, but what I want to just talk about is uh, breastfeeding and the microbiome. There is absolutely no doubt that breastfeeding is the food for microbes. It's a constant source of it. 30% of babies' microbes come from breast milk. Now there's some interesting studies about the differences between expressed milk, 
and um, milk taken directly from the breast. So part of the system is that the baby's mouth touches around the nipple. And, you know, it's quite amazing. Really. Did you know at the end of a feed, a baby will put a little bit back in called a backwash uh, and mum's body will analyse it. And if it finds anything that is a danger to the baby, by the time you next feed, you will be releasing antibodies for that. And what you also have there is a microbial transfer as well. So the microbes that baby deposits also have an impact on the milk that is produced. Breast milk is packed full of microbes. It's packed full of the food for microbes. And the trouble is that for a lot of women, they will really struggle to feed. And what I don't want is anybody feeling bad that I'm saying that breast milk is good. The, the, it is entirely up to you how you choose to feed your baby. What upsets me is that women who wanted to feed their baby weren't well enough supported to make it happen when it was difficult. And sometimes it is really difficult. Yeah, really, really difficult. Um, so what I'm talking about now is, honestly, it's, it's not a criticism of anybody's choice. This is just about what the science tells us in terms of breast milk. And just very quickly, as we said before, you have these over 200 human milk oligosaccharides, which some of them, they feed only particular and beneficial microbes for baby. We know that breast milk is associated with immune system training, and that's partly to do with the microbes. It alters the makeup of the microbiome, which is important. And we see that babies who are breastfed have a different microbial makeup than babies who are introduced to formula early on. And in fact, the second you introduce formula milk to a baby, it changes the makeup of the microbiome. This, it might, it's, the, it's the key thing until you wean. But even after you wean, any breast milk that goes in will help be of benefit to the baby. So that's really quite significant that you know direct there's a direct supply of microbes from breast milk but actually even after food becomes the main source of uh, microbes and input as it were then breast milk still has a role in feeding and supplying microbes now what i just want to say here and this is really important is that it, it isn't all set at birth it isn't all set by that infancy has a huge impact on microbiome and there is some talk that actually it's kind of the first three years are the key establishment of a microbiome and as you can see on here that there are lots of things that are making a difference to how an infant microbiome gets established so there's all the bit around birth but also how you feed them as a as um, a toddler antibiotics particularly in early life when you choose to wean and what you feed them on if a toddler diet is highly processed and does not include a wide variety of food that is going to have an impact on them environment and by this we mean you know is is environment almost too clean do they get to get outdoors do they get to get muggy, muddy do they get to play and and experience the natural world and take on all those microbes with them this is where pets come in. Having a dog in the first two years of your life can significantly improve your microbial health and help prevent things like asthma and allergies. Why? Because it is nigh on impossible to keep a house completely sterile if you have a dog in it. I have two and I can vouch for that. So pets can be very, very helpful. There isn't the same evidence on cats, I'm afraid, but you know, but just, you know, getting to go and pat somebody else's dog might work. Getting outdoors. Get them outdoors to play. Yeah, fabulous for them in so many ways, and one of those is microbial. And again, exercise. Microbes do better when the human attached or the human carrying them exercises a lot. So it's really important to remember that it is not all set at birth or in actually very early life. This has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour and an introduction to the microbiome, but I'm hoping that you see that actually pregnancy, birth, early years, such an impact and such a great gift that we can give our babies if we can help establish a good microbiome. So however your baby needs to be born, have the microbiome in mind, thinking about making sure that they get the best bacterial start. Please, please do join us on babiesbiome.org. There's uh, free resources there for birth workers or doulas and midwives. There's information for parents and we're adding stuff all the time and it's all just there as an information resource for you.
So my name is Bridget and I hope that this has been helpful for you.